Hello, folks. This is our final lecture for this series, and I wanted to spend just a little bit of time going back to yesterday and, and talk about a couple of things that I intended to mention and I forgot at the end. We look at mu music and art in very different ways, and uh, maybe we don't ask ourselves often enough, but the question is, uh, you know, is there a difference in quality between current popular music and classical music? If you um, were a student, you know, 30, 40 years ago, classical music would have been part of that repertoire. In fact, if you take music appreciation, they don't listen to rock and roll or country or any of those other genres. They listen to classical music and that's where they teach it because that is the historic uh, music of you know, the classics and, and those kind of things. But, you know, most people, your parents would look at the music you listened to as a kid and they would, uh, you know, say things about it. They didn't appreciate uh, Kiss or the Beatles or, you know, Beatles almost destroyed America in the 1950s because they were an affront to the, to the morals of America. And I, I look back at that now and laugh because, you know, they really were very well dressed. They were clean cut, their hair barely touched their ears and yet they caused a complete shipwreck in America with parents going crazy, girls especially going crazy, you know, over them. Uh, Elvis Presley was the same way. His music was quite different and yet people went completely berserk over his music and his times. It's like, uh, you know, they do over groups today. I'm not sure that people are quite so enamored by musicians today. Maybe they are. Maybe you would tell me that differently. Uh, but it's really interesting when we talk about is there a, is a, a plausible difference or is there an argument that uh, you prefer one music over another? That's something that's very unique to the human individual that comes out of you. You, you are more interested in uh, a certain type of music than you are others. And so the aesthetics of music and art, same way. Some art you may be drawn to some of it, you don't see the point. And I think that's true of me as well, that there's some that I just don't get much out of. The other thing I want to think about when we talk about reality and what's real and what's not real is the different genres of writing like fiction and nonfiction. You say, well, that's total fiction. That's totally made up. That's totally, but there's always some element of truth in fiction. Uh, it's not, you can't have complete uh, fiction uh, or complete, you know, untruth or no reality to it. There has to be some connection to reality in order for it to, uh, to function. And so you ask yourself the question whether art and, you know, aesthetic appreciation of that art can make you a better person or not. That's really an interesting question because they've literally tried with babies or even preborn babies. They, they have proven that if a mother listens to uh, classical music, say, in, in the time before she's bo the baby is born, that baby is much better adjusted. It is much calmer, where if she listens to rock and roll and some of the other louder, noisier kinds of music, the baby comes out already with a nerve, nerve problem, uh, with the shakes, if you will, or whatever. And so, you know, there is something to be said for the kind of music maybe that we listen to, whether it is good for us or bad for us. Uh, but listening to music can move us, uh, just like, you know, sometimes an art piece can move you. You can really appreciate that. And so I just want you to think about that as you, uh, as we think about the, the close of this class, that there's a lot of things that we've talked about that maybe are things that you haven't uh, you know, you haven't thought about before, but these are very much at the heart of what we are or who we are as Westerners. Today, we want to turn our attention to the, past, the last section, and that's on a non-Western philosophy. Uh, for years, we've taught Western civilization. Uh, that has recently changed. Now we teach world civilization because for, forever we have ignored that there is anybody else in the world but us. The whole orientation is westward. It is not necessarily eastward or anything else. When we teach Western civilization, we're actually ignoring some really great civilizations that came before us. We're not talking about the East at all. We're talking about a huge civilization in China, in Japan. We're not talking about India. 
uh, and India has one fifth of the world's population as does China. Uh, we're not talking about any of those things. We're talking about purely European American kind of historical thought. And in philosophy, we do the same kinds of things, but we realize that beyond that, there is something beyond the Western tradition. And so we want to talk a little bit about uh, differences between the, uh, us and them, if you will. Uh, Confucius uh, among the Eastern traditions, what he taught was a, you know, he was a philosopher in, in China and uh, their, their idea of philosophy is very different from ours. As I said before, the, the Eastern tradition, if you look at their historical position is much more circular. Uh, religiously, they practice reincarnation. They believe that you come back in a different order uh, and you don't, there is no past, middle and, and future like there is in Western tradition, which we owe to the Hebrews. Uh, they don't look at history that way. You're constantly in this process of recombining. And as such, there's not really a lot of figures that figure into the historical thought of most Eastern uh, countries. And so it's a very different place to live. If you've ever been there, you realize that it is, uh, you know, quite interesting to, I love being around Asian people and listen to them talk and, and to gain knowledge from them. Uh, we also there, but there are other cultures. And with those cultures, there are other philosophies. Uh, I think I told you last time I was at a powwow last weekend in my home county, and uh, Native Americans have their own philosophy about life. They have their own philosophy about the earth and how the earth should be taken care of. They did not take more than they needed. They did not waste things. They used every part of the animal that they killed. Actually, some of them apologized to the animal for killing it. They had to have its skin and its meat and its bones, all those things, but they used every piece of the animal so that nothing was wasted. And they they believe that animals had a moral dignity and ought to be treated in effect as persons. And so they were very careful about what they said or did uh, in that process. There's an African philosophy and Africa contains hundreds of different cultures, of course, uh, and hundreds of different languages. And as such, their philosophies will run counter to most of the things that we, we consider to be in the West, but there is a special sense of identity with nature there that we don't get in other cultures. Uh, tribalism also establishes a, a person's identity and significance as a person only in the context of his family and his community. So you, they have tremendous community and tremendous tribal ideas, just like Native Americans did. I, I think I've told you, but I, I taught a class uh, years ago at eight o'clock in the morning and I had a young man from Kenya who worked 13 hours to uh, the night before, always came to class at eight, always on time, never yawned, never slept, never looked like he was tired at all. And uh, one day he told me as he was leaving, he said, you know, Mr. Smith, he said, this class reminds me of home. He said, in Kenya, we have a gentleman, our, our histories are all oral. We have nothing written down. Our language is not written down. And he said, we have a gentleman at home that remembers the histories of 300 families and he travels from village to village to recite those histories and share those histories with us because he said he has that in his head, but it's only as good as, you know, he falls over dead, everything he knows goes with him. So, but there is a particular tribal sense to that. You, you go from tribe to tribe and you, uh, and they have beautiful artwork. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the, uh, African art, but it is fabulous. Uh, they believe in animism, which means that animals have spirits. They embody, you know, all kinds of different forces. Uh, then there's Latin American philosophy, which has its own particular flavor to it. Uh, uh, and it's very interesting to read a lot of these uh, books. You're going to, the book will introduce you to several Latin American philosophers and how they taught and what they, they understood. Uh, Middle Eastern philosophy is very different. I've spent quite a bit of time in the Middle East. I have been in Israel 11 times. I've been in Jordan, Syria, uh, and I've spent quite a bit of time with people like, you know, that live there that are influenced greatly by religion, that Jerusalem is the major religious city to the three great monotheistic religions. 
to Islam, to Judaism, and to Christianity, and they're always in contention. I saw this week where there was some some move to stop the Jews from praying uh, up on the Temple Mount because that's, that is an Arab stronghold, and they don't want them praying outside their mosque. So there's always something going on with them religiously over the land, over you know all parts. South Asian philosophy would be really interesting guided in India by the religion of Hinduism and a little bit of Buddhism. Uh, But Hinduism is a major religion. Hinduism has over 10,000 gods. And so uh, they worship the the Ganges River. They bathe in it, thinking that it will give them healing or whatever else they need. And that's important. So, and then basically Buddhism, which was founded by uh, in, you know, in the early years, 546 BCE. So you'll read about all these different philosophies, and I think it'll be very enlightening to you to do that. And I encourage you to be sure that you read about the different groups in these different places and their importance to the philosophies that come from that. So when you encounter somebody, don't be don't be afraid to talk to them or ask some questions or you know delve into uh, what their beliefs are because it's a great way to learn, great way to understand, uh, and great way to grow. That's what you're about. You're about expanding your knowledge and your education. And that's what this course has been about, philosophy of, of how we approach life, which is very distinctive. You may not realize how distinctive it is, but very distinctive how the, the West approaches life in a certain way that we have certain beliefs that you know we are somebody headed somewhere that we're going to accomplish that, that we have goals, that we have the idea of progress, that we're actually moving along a continuum toward being successful. That's very important. You don't see that in many other societies. So as you read the text, be sure that you kind of contemplate on these things. And it's been my pleasure to spend these times with you. And I hope that they will help, will prove to be a uh, continued help to you. Good luck with your studies. And uh, I look forward to hearing, seeing your work this week.